is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Jane the Virgin, Season 2, Episode 12, Chapter 34. In this episode, Jane debates the thing that I have been asking about, which is, what am I waiting for? Maybe I should just fuck and get it over with. But unsurprisingly, it's not that easy for her to give up on what she had imagined her first time would be. And it looks like maybe it pays off that she waited. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Natalia for commissioning this episode. Natalia, if you're out there, appreciate you very much. I just want to really like say, to start things off, I just really appreciate everybody who puts in to commission for Spoil Me. And y'all are... I, I... just can't tell you what it means to me to know that people give enough of a shit about my opinion and find me entertaining enough that you will shell out your cash. Like, it's just constantly humbling. I'm always just like, really? And I love my job so much. Like, I can't believe that I get to clock in and talk about this episode of Jane the Virgin. I have such a good job. So (laughs) this episode was really good too. I really, really like this one. And there's going to be a lot to get through. Normally I kind of go character by character and I am going to do that, but I'm going to like make sure as I go through the episode a little bit more carefully than usual that I don't skip anything because there's a lot going on. And the first thing I'm just going to talk about off the top is Jane and Chavez Jonathan Chavez. I, look, you guys know that I have been very excited about the development of this man's arrival in Jane's life. And I stand by that. I really wanted to break free of the the whole, like, there's only one man that exists in the world kind of attitude, or two men, I guess. Um, This is something that happens in a lot of stories. It's always difficult for me because there are just so many men out there. And Jean is young and beautiful, and she could probably just have her pick of whoever. So just this sort of, like, it's either them or them. I'm just like, come on. But Unfortunately, as much as I was very excited about his advent in her life, it turns out it's likely not really going to go anywhere. And this is like, you know, I have some real mixed feelings about it because on the one hand, I really want Jane to open her to broaden her horizons. That's the word I'm looking for. However, the thing that I'm struggling with, you would think it would be the fact that like, they're going back to Michael. But really what I'm struggling with is that this actually feels entirely in character for Jane. Like, she is just... I'm not, I, she's just not the type that is going to go out and have casual sex. And I understand kind of wishing that you were that person. Like I really do. I, I have some, I've had moments in my life where I've realized I'm X type of person. And a part of me is like, what if I'm not, what if I'm a Y type of person, but I've just never tried. And like, there are times where you can surprise yourself. I think a lot of us tend to sort of buck what is expected sometimes just because it's expected and we don't like being predictable. 
and not because we actually want to be doing the thing that is opposite of our usual MO. I don't feel like Jane is doing this with Jonathan. I, I really want to, to emphasize, like, I don't feel like she's out here just trying to prove somebody wrong about her and hook up so that she can just be like, see, I can do casual. It's almost like she's trying to prove herself wrong. Like she is so aware of how much she has built up her first time. And because it looks like the men in her life that she has cared about aren't options. And because she's getting older and she now has a child, she is trying to tell herself logically, I don't have any reason to wait. It's silly to keep putting it off like this. I'm making it such a, a big deal that it's just going to be it, it will be like a situation that can never live up to the expectations that I have. And so she's attempting to get herself to lower her standards a little bit in a way that I really like approved of in just the fact that she thought of it because continuing to pretend that she should just stay a virgin after everything felt weird. And I, I, I like that it's been addressed, but when you come right down to who Jane is, she is a romantic who wants her first time to be meaningful and trying to pretend that she can have casual sex with this guy and leave it at that. It's just not her, not for her first time. It's just, you know, I just really, I'm glad that she waited. And I really am surprised to hear myself say that, but like four different people, different standards. And Jane is, she is somebody who would regret trying to do the casual thing. She, she tried to logic herself out of her romantic, like personality. And, you know, sometimes there's just parts of our personality that logic doesn't have any effect on, <laughs> you know, like that just is, I am this way when it comes to like the aesthetic, I want things to be beautiful and even if I really can't have that, then I would rather not have it at all. Even though I know I need the thing. I am very irrational. Even when it, I can be so practical, you guys, I really, you don't even know. But when it comes to how things look, I will do way too much to get stuff to look how I want it to look. So I just really... The, the whole thing with her and this professor, like they have such good chemistry. It's such a shame, but it felt wrong to me as a viewer watching. I was just like this, you two, I just don't see it. I just don't see, especially with him talking about like leaving the country and stuff. I was really surprised at first that she was even considering sleeping with him after he shares that. And then when she's talking to her mom later and she's like, and see the fact that he's leaving will mean that I can't get too attached. I felt like that was a real red flag. Like you are, you have such a tendency toward getting attached so quickly that you need this man to physically be impossible to reach for you to feel comfortable sleeping with him, that's not a good place to be, you know? So we have like a couple of encounters. She has the first date with him. It's so great. They're making out in this restaurant. I don't know if I've ever had this kind of date where I've like made out in public. Like, like I've made out in places that were like at a park, you know, where there were people around. A restaurant is just a really specific kind of energy because everybody else is there to eat. You are bringing a vibe that's like, it's not wholly unexpected, but it's just you're going a little too far. And also, this sort of making out at a table really does tend to happen with people who are only just beginning to see each other. Either they haven't had sex yet and the tension is just crazy, so they're practically fucking at the table. Or... They have just started fucking and it's really good and they just can't keep their hands off each other. And so they're, you know, and I just don't think I have been on a date that was like real formal like this 
in a situation where I had this kind of chemistry and it, it it was just like impossible for me to restrain myself. And I kind of feel like I missed out a little bit, but like my dates were real casual, you know, a lot of like hangouts, a lot of uh, just like if we went out to eat, it would never be somewhere like this almost ever that this would be a very special occasion sort of place. So anyway, they're just, they're having a good time. He asked her to come over to his place because he does not yet know that she is a virgin. And so he's just trying to make it, you know, a thing, which is what happens in the flashback with her and Michael at the beginning of the episode where he brings her flowers and they're kissing. And he's like, maybe we should go over to my place because he's like on top of her in the bed. She calls a stop and she tells him she's a virgin. I'm waiting until marriage. And he says, then I guess we'll just have to wait until we get married, which is a great response. It's, it's, I'm not saying we're going to get married, but it kind of sounds like you're saying that in a way that's not like binding, but is genuinely romantic. And so I was sort of like, you know what, Michael, that was well done. Okay. The contrast with what happens because she finally agrees to go to his place, to Jonathan's and he makes pasta from scratch, which I have got to tell you guys, I don't know what I would do. Like when I was in my very late teens, very early twenties, I was dating a chef cooked like a maniac, which is probably where I learned a lot of what I know now from, to be honest. But I was so young and he was such a fuck up that his cooking, it was like always a sort of affair where there were people coming over. We almost never did a thing where he just cooked for me for the two of us. And as a grown woman now who has almost exclusively been with men since then who cannot cook at all, and I mean almost at all, like boiling water is a challenge. I don't know whether I would be like, just, I'm so glad that you can cook and this is a really nice change that I didn't have to, or if I would be sort of controlling about it and be like, I mean, the sauce is pretty good. He really should have added, you know what I mean? Like, would I ruin it for myself? Anyway, I also couldn't stop thinking about the fact that they've had pasta, which I'm going to assume contained a great amount of garlic because pasta almost always does. And they're just sitting there making out. And that is just how it be when you really want to fuck somebody is you do not care that they have garlic breath. It doesn't factor. So they're making out. She finally, like, there's a moment where he tells her, you're my first since my divorce. And she, the way he pauses, there's a moment where it seems like he's just saying you're my first, but then continues since my divorce. And this makes her sort of stop. It looks like she is just going to let it go. And then she sees a petal fall off of this like rose and she is suddenly struck with this guilt. She tells him not only that she's a virgin, but that it was it's because of a promise that she made to her abuela and then tries to wave that off and be like, it's no big deal and keep making out. And he rightfully just stops everything and is like, hold on, wait, what? And they can't get their mojo back. And she's like, did I ruin the mood talking about being a virgin? He was like, really more about your grandmother. Later on, when Jane tells her mother that sharing that she was a virgin brought everything to a screeching halt and that she's bummed about it, her mother says, or maybe you told him the truth because you didn't want to go through with it. She's right, Jane. That's why. You know it's why. Come on, girl. You know it's why. I really wanted her to be like, for real, about it. You saw that pedal fall and you had a moment of just panic 
And you told him because you needed everything to come to a stop and for it to be his idea. So then she's like, later on, after things have gotten weird between the two of them, she starts sexting him. And I'm just going to say right now, sexting is one of the best things. I love sexting. Like I, when Owen and I were first seeing each other and we lived far apart, constant. Oh my God, you guys, constant. It's actually something that I kind of miss. And we've been talking recently about like, maybe we should just like pick up sexting each other during the day again. Like maybe we should do that. And I love him like the the sexting when you're that close to somebody that you can actually go and see them because usually this is the sort of thing that's reserved on in television shows for like couples who aren't able to be near each other they you sext when you are in a long distance situation and i really enjoy that he is able to say like get over here right now and that is what she fucking does now what happens is that she's on her way over and she, he tells her, and don't you dare get dressed because she's literally in just a t-shirt and undies. And so she obeys. She doesn't get dressed, which uh, also hot, really a big fan of the fact that she's just like, okay, dad, I'll do whatever you want. I don't, that's weird though, that I said dad, because like, I know that daddy is a thing. But I'm uncomfortable with saying daddy because I don't I don't do that. I don't like it. So I tried to amend it by saying dad to make it less creepy. And it just made it more creepy. So I don't know what other how else I would say this. But you know what I'm saying? Just the fact that like, she obeyed orders. I'm a fan of a man who gives orders. I'm just I like it. So yeah. And she is in the car heading over a little overexcited and she speeds and gets pulled over and she hasn't got any pants on. And thankfully the cop is like very cool about it, but it's super embarrassing for her. And eventually he lets her go with a warning, which again, appreciate it. But seeing his badge, it, gets in her head. And this was sort of wild. I think that I had sort of forgotten, even though it was not that long ago. It's, it's a difficult thing when I'm covering the show the way that I am sometimes, because it will feel like something happened ages and ages ago. And it wasn't really that long in the context of the show. It's just that I had a delay in watching. But I'm sorry if you guys can hear that. I have a neighbor who is unwell, who lives next door and comes outside and just screams sometimes. So if you can hear that, that's who that is. Um, but I had forgotten how recently she had been sort of cyber stalking Michael and the way that he told her to back off. Like that was only three episodes ago, maybe. It was not long enough ago for her to really be over it. And yet I had been sort of thinking of her as over it. And, you know, the more I, I stepped back, I was sort of like, no, I guess it's like, yeah, she is still hung up on him really like in her heart, you know? So she, this gets in her head and she goes to Jonathan's house and is making out with him. But she's also like crying, like sobbing, crying. And he, it's so awkward, you guys. I really love how he just winds up sort of holding her and it's clear like he had been ready to go. He was going to smash that. But the panicky type of crying, her acting is so good. I just felt it. I just did you know? And it is because what she had wanted is just not happening. It's not going the way that she had imagined. And I felt for her because it's, it's just, that is not something that has been important to me, but I really understand as somebody who can have like expectations and want things to go a certain way that even if you know I can't continue to expect that. 
it's un, it, it, it's like difficult to let it go. So anyway, she leaves. It seems to me that's pretty much going to be curtains for the two of them. Now, I'm not sure. I've been thinking this over. And if he's leaving the country, that could either be an excuse for him to not be a factor for the next few episodes so that we don't need to see him. I don't know how long he's going for. I don't recall. But there's also, you know, the possibility that, like, he's going to go and then we're just literally never going to see him again because the show has forgotten about him or we're meant to forget. Or it could be that he goes away just long enough that things seem fine. And then he pops back in and complicates things because they still have this intense tension and uh, this deep attraction to each other. And I don't really know what I prefer. There's a big part of me that kind of doesn't want them to just call it quits because I like this guy. I really feel like the chemistry between the two of them is so strong that it feels like you you just owe it to the performances to continue to, you know, hear this out and see how it goes. But I can't help but feel like what? How does this work if he turns back up again? It, 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 like, the only way I feel like it could be picked up is if she had lost her virginity by then. And it weren't such an issue anymore. Because otherwise, I just don't really feel like anything would be different. So, anyway, all that to say, I am sort of like on guard about this at this point because it, it there's all right so i'm gonna i'm gonna address the elephant in the room especially with this episode we've already been told that michael dies right the narrator said it flat out we don't know when that's going to happen and i said in the first season if he's not dead by the end of the season that i'm really going to feel a way about it and then he didn't die in the first season. And now we're in the second season. And if he isn't dead by the end of this season, I am going to feel such a way about it. Just so you guys know for the record. So my expectation, if I'm being perfectly frank, is that Jane loses her virginity to Michael. They get back together and things seem great. And then he dies and now she is a woman with experience, widowed, mourning, and this dreamy mister comes back into her life. And she has to pick things up where she left off. That's like, it, it, that's the, the formula that I'm expecting. And it would make sense for him if he's only away temporarily to like come back into her life just right around when Michael dies. And that way she is all primed up to get involved in another relationship. So that's, that's my theory here. But at the end of this, when Michael turns up at her door, if you had told me this was where everything was going and the, you know, after all of this, she would still wind up kind of wanting to wait for Michael. I think I would have reacted very impatiently. But as it stands, I actually think this works because it's just so in character. It's fine. You know, it just seems like Jane. And if you're going to be in character, even if it is infuriating behavior, I have a hard time really holding it against you because character above everything as far as I am concerned. So that's what's going on with Jane. Then we have what's going on with Shamara and Rogelio. Now I'm not going to get into the whole kids thing again because I just don't get it. But I love where we end up here because at first he proposes to her again and it seems like he is accepting they won't have kids and is moving on. 
But eventually there's this moment where a little boy wants to get a selfie with him. And he teaches this little boy in just a few seconds exactly how to find your light and what angle to hold the camera at and everything for an optimal selfie. And she sees the way that he is with this little boy. And she asks him again later, are you sure this is what you want? And he says, I mean, no, but I'm sure about you. Which I loved that response. Honestly, that was like, if he had just stopped there, perfect. But he doesn't stop there. He then says, and who knows, maybe you'll change your mind. And that is the kiss of death. Anybody out there listening to this, if you are with somebody that you got involved with making a certain desire clear and they aren't taking it seriously and keep pushing for you to change your mind about it, you have got to be honest and get out because you want different things and that's going to go badly. It's really guaranteed eventually to go badly because there's only so long that you can put off that kind of thing. So what he proposes is freezing her eggs so that if she were to change her mind, despite the fact that she's old enough that she'll be going through menopause and unable to have children fairly soon, they will be able to potentially have a child by a surrogate later. She agrees to do this, and I really understood at the time why she did, because it feels like a kind of compromise where you are preparing yourself for maybe I will change my mind because I have done it before. Like, he's not wrong about that. But she's watching a scene. He is in this telenovela. It's the time travel thing. And he goes back in time to women's suffrage to become the world's first male feminist and is making out with Susan B. Anthony, who, by the way, was a massive racist and would never lay her lips on the mouth of a brown man, but whatever. And uh, he says something to her about like her needs also being important in the scene. And that is what leads Shamar to realizing like, wait, yeah, my needs are important. Oh, no. And so later... She goes to talk to him and she had changed Mateo's diaper. And there's this real moment when she's like changing him that feels as if she is starting to reconsider if she wants kids or not. And I was sort of like, I, I, we're not doing this, are we? Like, I got really anxious for a moment. But it turns out that she's realizing she loves having the choice on whether or not to change his diaper because she isn't obligated since she's a grandmother. She can come and go as she feels and how much she values that, which that's exactly my vibe. I get it. And she gives the ring back and tells him like, I just don't want that. And you clearly do. And you should have them. And it's just... You know, for me, you are in love with a person and you are going to forsake that for the the hypothetical child that could eventually maybe come around if that person were to move on, find someone they would want to co-parent with and then have a child maybe if both of them turned out to be fertile and it worked out, which is also not a guarantee. Like there's just so much uh, potential for that to go left and not ever work out. I would rather be with the person that I am in front of who I love and pursue the thing I have now than risk like ruining everything and regretting it forever for some child that may never come to be. And, you know, this is just my opinion, you know, so <sighs> In in the end, they wind up split. He's left standing there with the ring in his hand, staring at it like he doesn't even really know what just happened. Like, it, it just happened so quick that he doesn't even process it until she's, like, out of the room. 
And I was just sad about it because I don't think, I don't, I'm not saying Rogelio would be a bad father, but I am saying that Rogelio is in the time of his life that Shamara is trying to get to and also doesn't have time for children and doesn't seem to realize that he doesn't have time for children. If he wants his career to continue on the path that it is currently on and he wants to be a good father, you can't do both of those things. You can't constantly be at work and be a good parent. Like the, the way that he would have to, I'm not saying that if you were somebody who works a ton, that you're not being a good parent. I'm talking about the kind of demands that, that a, Hollywood, oh, excuse me, that a Hollywood job would require and how, like, if you're working because you're providing for your family, it feels very different than I am in this job because it, like, really feeds my ego and my vanity, where he could potentially give up some of, like, the spotlight in order to spend time with his child and Then if he gave it up and he's sort of in this space where if he loses any momentum, it's going to sort of fall apart, which is the impression we have been given. You know, it's like his his being fired from the show and off on his own for a couple of years. It really caused a drop in his lifestyle, in his popularity, his income. And I don't see how he can maintain what he's doing now with a new child that requires attention. It would be nannies. It would be relying a lot on his wife. And I just don't feel like that's the kind of father he seems like he would want to be. So I just kind of would like for him to be a little bit more honest about whether this is something that he could even do, you know? But anyway, okay, so that's a wrap on those two. Um, Now let's see, where are we going to go? Let's talk about the whole thing with Petra. Because it's a weird, I really enjoy the conflict between Petra and Jane because of how, how much I understand both of their perspectives. Jane is somebody who comes from not a lot of money, is on guard all the time for overspending, especially like in unnecessary ways that feel sort of predatory, potentially. And she later, there's a whole like issue with Petra. She wants very much some help with the baby stuff, but she doesn't really want to admit that she needs the help. So what it is that Raphael decides to do is send Jane in kind of covertly to assist, but not make it obvious that's what's happening. And at first Petra is very receptive and like, Oh God, yes, I would love to like talk baby stuff. And Jane even offers to throw a a baby shower for her, which Like, it seems so sweet at first, but then as things went on, I really was just like, Jane, don't. Why are you doing this? But it worked out. Um, So they wind up sitting next to each other at lunch, I think, somewhere, just looking through baby stuff online. And what Jane is doing is basically going through their own like registry and pointing out the things that worked for her and Raphael. And Petra is really cranky. She's obviously cranky for many reasons, but it's clear in particular that she is having a a strong reaction. Every time Jane says, this is what Raph and me have. And we really love it. Anytime there's like a mention of her and Raphael Petra rolls her eyes or just pri- just winces or whatever, you know, and it's really like funny to me because when you thought, when she said, do you want to talk baby stuff? Like, what were you expecting? Did you think Raphael wasn't going to come up? Like just genuinely, ma'am, 
how could you th- not know this is how the conversation would go? But anyway, she also is like looking at some pacifiers and there's a set that's like considerably less expensive. The ones she's looking at are two for $12, which Jane says is quote ridiculous. And then goes over to, here you go, like four pacifiers for eight fifty or something. And Petra immediately jumps to, why do you think those aren't as good? Like, maybe that's why they're $12, because they're better. And Jane, who is clearly so caught off guard by this assertion, immediately is like, or they're trying to rip you off. And Petra feels talked down to and also very judged, which is fair. Jane is judging her. She is. Like, Jane also comes across as judgy when Petra says that she won't be breastfeeding. Like, there's just a lot about the way that Jane reacts to stuff that I know she doesn't mean it to sound like it sounds, but it does sound that way. And I would take it the same exact way Petra did. As for the pacifier thing, it's one of those like cases where I firmly believe some things cost more because they are actually better. There are things in life that you just, the quality, there's no question. If you buy a, a cheap, shitty pair of shoes versus a more expensive pair that are built for specifically whatever it is you're doing instead of you making do with a random pair that's the best that you could find below $20, the chances of the more expensive shoe wearing for longer, being more comfortable and feeling more appropriate, you know, that's, that's real. And I struggle with that a lot as somebody who is poor and as somebody who wants to not have to replace shit over and over because I feel that I am getting scammed, I try and find a happy medium between something that is quality and will last versus something that is completely out of our price range that we have to go into debt for or so inexpensive as to barely get us through the next couple months before we have to replace it again. And yet there are items with which worrying about that sort of thing is pointless. Like these pacifiers, and this is purely, correct me, anybody listening who actually has children and has dealt with pacifiers. But what I understand about pacifiers is that they get lost fucking constantly. Like they just vanish into thin air is the way I hear it. So pacifiers specifically are the kind of thing that you get cheap because it doesn't matter. It's just going to be gone, you know, and you have to, it's, it's like getting like those cheap, like dollar gloves in Walmart that are like elastic and, and really, you know, one size fits all and whatever. If you lose gloves constantly, yeah, don't buy $60 calfskin gloves. Like, you know, I get it. So I felt what Petra was saying. I also wanted Jane to see where Petra was coming from because Jane definitely has got some high end items. She's somebody who searches for a bargain. Yes. But you know, when it comes to a car seat, there's no way she's cheaping out on a car seat. You know, something that the the quality is the a difference in safety, then yes, that matters a lot. And that is the sort of time when Jane would be very open to that. And I really wanted Jane to like explain that I'm not saying cheap for the sake of it, that you should get everything cheap. I am saying that there are going to be things that are basically disposable items and investing in those isn't going to help. It's not going to matter. But the the whole point between the two of them is that they don't like have a similar outlook on almost anything. So as much as it starts off in like a pretty good place, eventually Petra is just irritated. And she, we see like this back and forth of Jane and Petra, each complaining about the other. And I really liked how this was done. 
there, you know, Jane is saying, and she wants to pay more for things because she thinks it has to actually be better just because it costs more, which when you put it like that sounds asinine, but that's not really what she was saying. And when we go to Petra, she's saying, and Jane criticized me for wanting the best things for my child, which wasn't what Jane was saying. I get what you mean, but that's not what was happening. And I just love that when you have two totally different takes on a sentence and you you get why they each took it the way they did, because they already have like misconceptions about the other person. But that was so not what was happening, you know? So anyway... Raphael blurts out, we were just trying to help. Like a fucking dunce. And she's immediately like, what do you mean? And he explains, it seemed to me like you needed some help. I was just trying to help. And she gets really resentful of that. And later on, when it's time for her baby shower... She is nowhere to be found. And Jane is trying to text her and call her. She's not getting any response. Eventually, she goes and finds her and she's in her office, like actively ignoring her. And Jane says, I, what are you doing? You have to get down there. It's your baby shower. And Petra says, I thought I made it clear I didn't want a baby shower, which she basically said, I don't want your a pity party, but a pity party is like a metaphorical thing. So I get why Jane didn't really take that super literally. However, Jane's saying like, no, you didn't make that clear. A part of me was sort of surprised to see that Jane continued to do it because I did sort of take it as Petra saying, cancel the thing, you know? Anyway, this is when it comes out that Petra actually believes that Jane is waiting in the wings for Raphael to come like back into her life. Like she actually wants him back and is toying with him. Maybe I don't know what she thinks Jane is doing. And so she sort of drops the fact that her and Raphael kissed as this like major bombshell, even though it's obvious like to Jane the fact that they kissed isn't the the issue. It's that he just didn't tell her, which feels weird to her. And she's sort of like getting on, on track again and realizing what's going on. And she's like, so wait, you think that I want to be with him? And Petra's like, yes. And when Jane says, I don't, Petra says, does he know that? And Jane has told him that. But when she's asked the direct question, you sort of see the moment where she stops and is like, I thought he did, but maybe I didn't come across sincerely enough or he didn't hear me. So she decides, all right, it's time to go have a conversation with him. I really liked how this conversation went. I really, really did. Because I needed a little bit of like reassurance that she wasn't going to go back and try and like pick him back up as well. I didn't want to feel worried, you know, about this. Like, I, I don't know. I just, I, I am so out of the two of them. If we are going to pretend that Raphael and Michael are the only ones in the world, I'm picking Michael. I just don't like Raphael that much. So, I was a little bit sort of uh, worried that we were going to see her turn a corner again and suddenly be like, oh, wait, I've made a terrible mistake. Instead, she goes to speak to him and tell him, I really don't want to be with you anymore. I'm not after you. And the way that it goes is that he initially tries to pretend that he doesn't know why he didn't tell her about the kiss. And then he almost instantly stops himself and says, yes, I do, because I'm, I still love you. And I loved the fact that he had the emotional intelligence to understand why he did it and to 
actually be honest with her about it because I was really concerned that he was going to keep playing this sort of weird game and it's boring kiddos. It's just dull. So yeah, I was very, very glad to see that he instantly is just like, you know what? Why am I saying? I don't know why I did it. I'm not going to bullshit you. Yes, I do. I know why. And he says to her, we were in love. Like this, there's basically an insistence. We can get back there again. And Jane tells him, no, we cannot. And he says, why not? And she says, because my feelings have changed. I am not in the place that I was. And it's not going to happen. I was so grateful, you guys. This is the sort of thing that people will say. If we were in love once, that sort of thing doesn't just go away. It does, though. We don't like admitting that. There's a weirdness about it. Like, we don't, We really seem to think societally, romantically, like, as a sort of ideal, that if you love somebody... It, like at one point in your life, there will never be a time where you truly don't anymore. That that's like, for better or worse, a sort of permanent thing that you'll always feel. Even if things don't work out, even if you're angry or hurt, but it's just not true. It's simply not. There are people that I loved dearly that I don't think about at all anymore. And people that really, I thought I would spend my life with that. I just have no response when I, when I think about them, there's no feeling of anything. And if I were to see them, it would be genuinely like weird and uncomfortable because no, that isn't there anymore. So I really liked that she gets to say we were in love. That was real, but it's not permanent. It doesn't just stay and simply because we felt this way once doesn't mean it's it's waiting in the wings for us to like get it again that's not it at all i'm so relieved because i didn't know y'all like i really wasn't sure how, what we were gonna do here so he seems to hear her i'll say that he really does appear to step back and feel that she is telling the truth, that this isn't something that she wants. And I don't know if that means that he lets himself get more invested in Petra. I'm not sure Petra is going to be receptive if he were to try and reach out after it being so clear that he's hung up on Jane. Like she already sort of pushed him away for that once. So I'm curious where it goes. But, you know, as of right now, I'm just glad for the sake of the fact that Raphael is out of the picture for us as viewers. Cause I just was bored of him anyway. Um, so <laughs> it ends this whole thing with Petra, uh, at her baby shower and her and Jane, like have this, you know, I like honesty. Well, me too. And they finally feel like, Oh, there's something we have in common. And so when Jane was about to like, give this insincere toast, as Petra put it, instead, she stands up and she starts her sentence and is like to Petra who, and you see Petra just staring at her. And Jane finally says, is going to have two babies, which is simply factually correct and not saying anything about Petra as a person or Jane lying about how she feels about her. And uh, you see Petra being actually like very grateful and sort of approving over the fact that it, you know, Jane understood and respected her enough that she would be that sort of transparently diplomatic in front of everybody, you know, where some folks might find that almost scandalous, the way that that was like a real non statement. Petra is like, okay, yeah, see there, thank you. And I just really 
enjoyed that Petra sincerely stood by what she had said, because there are a lot of folks out there that will say they love honesty, that they value it. And really, guys, like, they don't. They say they love honesty a lot of the time, because they're kind of shitty, and they just like to say mean things to people. And they want a pass for that. But when it comes to like being on the receiving end of some realness, it's a totally different response that you get, which can be confusing because you thought that they liked honesty. So I just really loved that. It was clear instantly. Petra was like, aha, there. Yes, perfect. Because I, you know, they've really brought me around on Petra. It's been a long, slow move to starting to like see it for her and then they had her impregnate herself and I was just like I can't I can't ever again with Petra that's that's a wrap but then they started the new season with her being like I can't believe I did that what the fuck was I thinking and then they sort of pulled me back in and like at this point I feel like pretty much they've got me I think they might just got me with Petra so and on, and you know what? Her expectations and Raphael's expectations for what it would be like to raise a kid are going to be so much more in line than what it's like with him and Jane. Like, I wonder almost if there's that's going to be an issue that he and Petra see eye to eye so much more than he and Jane ever did that Jane might feel like almost threatened by that. Not because she wants him so much as Jane wants the ideal version of everything and a relationship between parents who see the, like all of their goals for their children the same way that's ideal and I could see her just being jealous of that you know so um all right so what what else have we got going on this episode I'm kind of you know doing my thing going around and I'm trying to make sure that I haven't missed anything. Oh my God. I forgot about the glider that Jane mentions. And uh, Petra says, I find gliders really ugly. And I was like, yeah, I do too. They actually are. However, Jane's like, well, we really like it if we have to do midnight feedings. And she's like, oh, I'm not going to have to worry about that because I'm going to have a nanny. And then Jane says, well, maybe the nanny would want to sit in it, but there's a real tone to her voice. Like, uh, I can't believe I'm saying this, or I can't believe that you would be so dismissive of what might be comfortable for a nanny. That whole thing was really funny because Petra doesn't hear what it sounds like to a poor person to be like, you, I, I, I could just hire somebody to do that hard part for me. But the way that Petra frames it later when she's talking to Raphael is Jane is such a martyr she has to do everything herself. And that was really interesting to me. I had never even considered that people might see Jane as like martyrish. And the, uh, it, it makes sense. Like, you know what I mean? I got what she meant. Um, working class hero type thing, you know? But uh, anyway, all right. So now let's talk about Louisa and what's going on with Rose, RIP, and uh, Michael. Because Michael comes back into Jane's life only because, spoilers, Rose dies at the end of the episode. I, so Louisa gets into a car accident. And the way that this happens is she goes to apologize to Raphael. And it's this whole song and dance where she's trying to explain to him that she, Louisa, basically replaced her addiction to alcohol with an addiction to Rose and became so obsessed and couldn't let her go. And that is a quote. And she's like, is, does that make any sense? And he says, no. And like closes the door in her face. And I, it, that's not that he doesn't close the door in her face, but it's like, you know, the metaphorical door. And 
later on when he's talking to Jane, he sort of hears his sister's voice in his head echoing about like not being able to let Rose go, which I'm, I'm was sort of wondering, does this mean that she, he's going to extend forgiveness to her and it, and reconnect because now he gets it? I don't know. But, uh, he, she, she leaves his room and you see her standing in the hall as a housekeeper's cart rolls by covered in mini bottles of booze and in bottles of champagne and everything like that is a stacked mini bar. And, uh, you see Louisa sort of looking at it. And I really felt in the moment when she was looking that there was no danger at all. It just, she looked like somebody who was detached from her desire for alcohol in a, in a way that she could look at it, acknowledge that she feels this desire and yet not feel controlled by it and could step back and then be like, okay, I'm definitely not doing that, but I felt that impulse and I had to acknowledge it. And now we're moving on. So when it turns out that she is in this car accident later, I was truly taken aback because I just really didn't think it seemed like she was fighting an urge and come to find out that's not how it went actually it's interesting though because they've set all so much up that i was sort of wondering is it going to be like th that rose was watching her every step of the way i really couldn't tell i think that it's like for the viewer's benefit not rose's that she has this wistful look but they did go ahead with the whole car accident thing and act apparently like had her really total a car um just to get rose into the the hospital because it looks at first like they're setting up a whole other thing but it turns out that louisa is the main bait that they're using so the microchip that has the names of all of the people out there whose faces have been changed and everything. We have like this like hint at the end of the last episode where we see Rose and Mutter, whose name I literally can never remember. I'm so sorry. They are talking about the fact that the cops have the microchip as being a real problem for them. But I was so confused, you guys, because I was like, I, I feel like, didn't we know that they were, that they were allied together? And it turns out like the part that I was supposed to be alarmed by is that they know the microchip is in the cop's hands in the first place. I didn't pick up on that being what I was supposed to care about. Forgive me. I just really wasn't getting it. So... She, she's saying this as a big reveal, but it turns out this episode that Michael already has put two and two together, that more than likely there is some sort of, of signal that gets sent from this chip when it's activated, when, when somebody accesses it. So it's actually no big deal at all. And he ha has found this dude who had his face changed and this guy is like set up to present this really clear, obvious trap where you tell her to meet with you alone in such and such place to exchange for the microchip, tell her to come alone. And I was like, this whole thing reeks. Like, this is a really bad plan because th at this point, we don't know about the whole Louisa thing yet. And we see him standing outside, looking around anxiously. And we hear Michael being like, all right, here she comes as Rose pulls up. But the way it's cut, you can't tell they're not in the same place. And then when it pulls back, you see Rose in the hospital with Louisa. And it turns out that Michael knew right where the fuck she was going to be actually. 
And I loved this twist and the fact that they were smart enough to tell what was going on. I just really liked the whole fake out because I, there are like a surprising number of fake outs that I have seen through. And it wasn't like they were done so poorly. It was just the nature of, of them. I just, and this one, I didn't get like, I didn't see through it at all. They really got me. Um, and it really just made my respect for Michael go up as well because he is so, uh, he, like, I have a tendency due to his good nature and the fact that some people who shall remain nameless kind of ran circles around him a little bit in the last season. I have a tendency to see him as sort of bumbling. And I just liked being reminded sometimes he is good at his job, actually. You know, like sometimes it's not just that we needed a cop on the show for tension, but he actually can do stuff. So I also have to say, too, that when Rose realizes she has been set up by Louisa, the genuine shock on her face she never thought for a moment Louisa would ever do this. And I can't help but think Louisa is going to have a hard time dealing with the guilt of knowing that she set this trap that resulted in Rose's death. Like, you know, I I don't know why Rose was killed exactly. I was sort of thinking because it surprised me that she was allowed to come to the hospital at all, that maybe she had been forbidden to go because it was putting herself in danger and she went anyway and had to be got rid of because it was clear she was like letting her emotions get in the way of stuff. I don't know who was able to kill her that quickly. And the fact that it was done with that blue silk cord, I know that we need to have a calling card, but it doesn't make it any less funny every time. Those blue silk cord things are so silly. It's fine, but they are. Um, but this, the the whole like moment between the two of them of it really registering that after everything Louisa has set her up when Rose is so used to being the one to do the setting up. I couldn't help but laugh about this because Rose has played Louisa over and over again, but she looks so disgusted with Louisa. And I was like, where do you get off after everything you fucking, you killed this woman's father. And you have the nerve to be like, how could you? Bitch, shut the fuck up. What are you talking about? You, are you, how fucking dare you? Oh my God. So anyway, <laughs> the, uh, the whole wrap up, like Rose takes, What's her name? Rebecca? Is it? Oh, guys, I'm so sorry because I am really bad at remembering Michael's partner's name. And the way the narration plays it is pay very close attention because one of these women is going to die. Susanna. But Susanna gets shot and I don't think she's on death's door. She's like standing in the background at one point. So it really, really seems to me like she's going to be just fine. But I was sort of curious, like, if now Rose is out of the picture, are we going to revive the thing going on between her and Louisa, which I didn't have a lot of interest in? It was fine, but I just didn't, you know, and that's sort of the danger, I think. I don't know if any of y'all feel the same way that I do about this. But I find myself actually a bit bored now by the Mütter storyline. Um, it's just not a, like a clear and present issue anymore the way that it was when everybody was still at the hotel involved with each other on a day-to-day -day basis. So they need to find, in my opinion... They need to find a way to get everyone back into that part of the story. I don't know what that looks like. I'm not trying to say I have like this, you know, script in my head, but I'm saying that as of right now, 
whenever we go to Michael's storyline, I feel the momentum of the episode drop a bit. And the, the, I was thinking that we were getting what I'm asking for now with the fact that uh, Raphael's mother turned out to be her. But then they reveal that like right away. And so him, that this being his mother, as of right now, it doesn't really feel all that relevant to anything. And I don't know why she would like pursue it in such a way that it would be relevant again. That's a, you know, real particular question. So I'm just sort of sitting here kind of feeling like I need there to be someone on the inside that's no good. Or we need Michael to die very, very quickly, very, very soon. One of the two. Because I I want something that I feel more passionately about with that storyline. Um, but anyway, yeah. So it ends up with Rose being dead, and uh, I am I am just really, really like I said at this point with Rose being dead. She was the one thing that made me care because Louisa cared about her. But Raphael doesn't even really have a relationship with his mother that he could feel betrayed by her. Exact, You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Maybe they can make it happen. But I'm sitting in a place of real dubiousness right now. So we'll have to see. I'm over time. I'm way over. So I got to go. But I really thank you guys so much for coming to hang out with me. I hope that you're enjoying the coverage. I'm really enjoying the show. And until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.